Hello, welcome back to Skyview Concert Hall and a new season of Da Capo. I'm Ashley Johnson. And I'm Greg Scholl, trombonist in the Vancouver Symphony. Welcome to Da Capo. So this weekend, we have the pleasure of playing a piece by a contemporary living composer, Danny Howard, uh, with the piece Argentum. That's right. Danny Howard is a British composer and orchestrator who's becoming rather internationally well known. Her career as a composer started just a few years ago, but she's made great headway. This is the first time that the Vancouver Symphony has played any of her works. She wrote a trombone concerto. We sort of have a brass theme going through our music this weekend. Uh, she wrote a trombone concerto in 2021, and this was very well received after its debut with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. And there is video available on the internet of the performance of this piece, as well as some of the rehearsals that took place. This sort of started her off in the big leagues, and this piece was later performed by lots of groups, including the London Symphony Orchestra. So she's had some recent but big success and is a young composer on now, I guess, the international scene. So tell me a bit about our piece for the weekend, Argentum. Argentum was commissioned by Classic FM. And so Classic FM is this online radio station. It's probably available through a lot of different subscription services. Uh, it is based in the United Kingdom and they were having a celebration for their 25th year in operation. And so they joined with the World Philharmonic Society and commissioned Danny Howard to write this piece called Argentum for their celebration. This was actually the first piece to be broadcast on Classic FM as we know it today. So when they started, it was an FM radio station. Mm -hmm. They gradually got involved in more platforms. And when they finally became the streaming service Classic FM, they had this big celebration and they hired Danny Howard to write this piece of music. And it sounds like a celebratory piece. It has that sort of festive atmosphere to it. It's modern, it's not dissonant or anything like that. Uh, and it really presents a great start to our season this year in Vancouver Symphony. Well, wonderful. It's always very exciting to get to perform work by a new composer. And this weekend, we get two living composers on the menu. Another composer on the repertoire this weekend is Antonin Dvorak, which is a personal favorite of mine. We're doing his Symphony Number no. 8. We have talked about Dvorak before, and of course, his work has been a staple for not just the Vancouver Symphony, but every symphony in the <laughs> United States and in the world. Uh, the Symphony Number no. 8 is a piece that was written in 1889, and Dvorak wrote a dedication to it that says, to the Bohemian Academy of Emperor Franz Joseph for the encouragement of arts and literature in thanks for my election. In fact, Dvorak had just joined this group, joined this institution or been appointed uh, to the institution and wanted to dedicate this piece to the emperor for making that happen. The piece was composed in 1889 and it was premiered in early 1890. So Dvorak is maybe most well known for a sort of a weird, maybe even spooky sound, but this symphony is a little different. That's right. This is different, not only from other symphonies or large-scale works by Dvorak, but it's different from symphonies of this period. This part of Romanticism um, has often a sort of gloomy undertone mm -hmm. or things that we're all familiar with in the music of Brahms and other composers. Uh, this piece, unlike other Dvorak pieces, sounds more cheerful and optimistic. And that's not to say there's not major key movements and happy or triumphant sounding music in all of Dvorak's pieces. Uh, but this one really stands out as a cheerful and more optimistic sounding piece than some of the other ones that he wrote. 
And he said that Symphony No. 8 would be different from the other symphonies with individual thoughts worked out in a new way. Hmm. The eighth is just sort of cheery sounding and lyrical, and it draws its inspiration more from some of the pleasant sounding bohemian folk music that Dvorak loved so much. Dvorak, at a certain point in his career, uh, moved to the United States. It was right around that time, right? Yes, it's almost immediately after the premiere of this work in 1892, all the way till 1895, Dvorak was the director of the National Conservatory of Music in New York City. This is an institution that doesn't exist there anymore, but he was tempted and brought to the United States by a lavish sum of $15,000 per year. This was going to be his salary. Now, if you change that into modern day dollars, this is more than half a million dollars a year to come and be the director of this conservatory in New York. And it's 25 times more than what he was being paid at his old job at the Prague Conservatory. Now in the long run, the money didn't quite work out and Dvorak after several years became homesick. And so he returned back to Europe but he did have this three-year stint as a composer and conductor and educator in the United States. So besides uh, the exorbitant salary, was there anything else that sort of drew Dvorak to the United States? Yes, he really had a mission which was to discover what he thought of as American music and to engage with that music as he had done with Czech idioms in his home country and in an uh, area of the world that at the time was described as Bohemia. He wrote articles about African American music and Native American music, mm. but it's unclear if he really had those two kinds of music conflated somehow, mm. or if he really even heard Native American or early African American music. It does seem clear that Dvorak was not aware of segregation in the South or some of the other things that were going on with different cultural groups during this time period in the United States because he was living in New York City, which is a very different sort of atmosphere than, mm. say, somewhere in the southern United States. Nonetheless, his understanding of these types of melodies was aptly reflected in the music that he wrote while he was here, including his famous Symphony No. 9, which is called From the New World. So you mentioned he was staying in New York City. Did he mainly remain there? He stayed in New York City almost all the time, except for a very famous period in the summer of 1893. When he was working in New York City, he had a secretary who was a fellow Bohemian or a person from Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. And his secretary had been living in a place in Iowa, and he invited Dvorak to go live in Iowa for the summer, and Dvorak did it. He went to a Czech-speaking town in Iowa that's called Spillville, and he loved it there. He felt quite at home. Everyone spoke his native language, the foods, the things that people talked about were all very relatable to him. Mm -hmm. And so he had this sort of wonderful summer in Iowa. Eventually, though, he did decide to return to his beloved homeland. That was in part because the exorbitant salary that tempted him to the United States wasn't quite coming through. And also, his works were gaining a lot of popularity in Europe during this time. Uh, including his famous cello concerto. And so the time seemed right to go back home and bask in some of the glory. <laughs> so this time in Iowa, is that when he wrote New World Symphony? Yes, and this piece does contain in the second movement one of the most American themes. Everyone sort of recognizes this music. Da, 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 and so on. This music pops up everywhere, and it sounds so much like a hymn or early African-American influenced mm -hmm. theme that people have suspected at times he stole this melody uh, from someplace in the United States. There are many adaptations of this music. There are many alternative titles to this music. It was adapted and the title Coming Home was attached to it and it gets used in all kinds of media. The truth is he did write this theme on his own 
in that style, and he did it very, very well. He did mm -hmm. it very convincingly. So convincingly that that theme has really become ubiquitous with American music by American composers, such as Appalachian Spring, mm -hmm. West Side Story, Rhapsody in Blue. You got to count the New World Symphony as one of those famous American pieces, even though it was not written by an American composer. <laughs> so this weekend, we will be hearing the Eighth Symphony. That's right. And this piece, again, has kind of a sunny disposition to it. It is remarkable because it presents a set of varied themes rather than just focusing on one or two melodies. And there's a tie-in between that and the piece that we'll play by Salvador Brotons this weekend. Mm -hmm. When you listen to the Eighth Symphony, you can definitely hear the influence of Brahms, who was a big supporter of Dvorak. And this piece, I think, brings to mind sort of these romantic pastoral landscapes, if you will, and things like that. It's very pleasant, and the melodies are very Czech-influenced. Mm -hmm. You can definitely hear that uh, sort of quintessential Dvorak sound to the way this music comes off of the concert stage. Well, I cannot wait to hear that Dvorak sound. <laughs> it's going to be quite exciting. It is always a pleasure when we get to perform a piece by our conductor and music director, Salvador Brotons. And this weekend, we're hearing uh, something for a brass quintet. That's right. Uh, Salvador Brotons is a conductor of the Vancouver Symphony and other groups. Um, he's also a composer, and it is exciting and we seem to say this a lot in the Vancouver Symphony, which I think is a good sign. It's exciting to play works by composers that are still alive. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting to play a work by a composer that is at the performance. And the best thing is to perform a new piece by a composer that's still alive and is at the performance and is conducting the performance. So we really have sort of a triple play coming from our <laughs> musical director this week. Salvador is a famous conductor and composer. He graduated from the Barcelona Conservatory and then went to play principal flute in the Barcelona Orchestra. He came to the United States because he went to Florida State University uh, to get his doctorate of musical arts. And then he ended up at Portland State University where he was teaching and conducting. That was in the early 90s. That's when I first met him. During that time, he got picked up by the Vancouver Symphony and he has been here ever since. So Maestro Brotons is quite a prolific composer. That's the truth. He has about 150 or more published works that are played all over the world. There's 16 or more recordings that he's made, including some with the Vancouver Symphony. One of the first pieces by Salvador Brotons that we performed was his Stabat Mater, which is an orchestral and choral piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and he recorded that. that. That was recorded at the time, and uh, it's still available in many different formats. How would you describe Maestro Broton's style as a composer? His style is pretty recognizable. It is modern, but it is not dissonant. I would say that his music, to me, sounds like it has an incredible amount of clarity. Hmm. The lines are very sort of I don't want to say mean and lean, because they're not mean at all, but that's the kind of construction or the architecture of these pieces. It's always very clear what different sections of instruments are doing. He's very good at getting the thematic uh, sounds across. He's a very good orchestrator. And the music just sounds very strong. It's not dissonant or anything like that. Uh, but it doesn't sound old-fashioned either. It's sort of just a very nice example of modern writing. So he's a, he's a pretty busy guy these days. That's for sure. Salvador conducts all over the world, not just here in Vancouver. We're used to working with him here, and audiences know him, and this happens every couple months, uh, sometimes with more frequency, but the truth is he's conducting all over the world during the weeks that we do not see him. He has conducted in Israel, France, Germany, China, Poland, Uruguay, South Korea, Mexico, and Colombia, to name a few. So we're very fortunate that he keeps us in the rotation. 
remains our music director and continues to improve the sound and the ability of the Vancouver Symphony. Can you describe the Concerto for Brass Quintet? Yes, this piece was written originally for brass quintet and piano in 2014, so it's 10 years old. In that first piano and brass quintet arrangement, the composer, Salvador Brotons, already had the orchestration in mind. So it wasn't a process where he envisioned the piece for brass quintet and piano and then later decided to explode it to an orchestra. Mm -hmm. He knew that that's what he wanted all along. It was, I guess, easier to start it off with a piano reduction, but he knew that this uh, piece would include a full orchestration, which he added on later. The piece has three movements. The first movement is in sonata form with many small themes that sort of connect together, not unlike the Dvorak Eighth Symphony. Instead of one huge, all-encompassing theme that lasts for a whole movement, you have different melodies that are put together. In the first movement of the Brass Quintet Concerto, instead of a development of those themes, what you have is individual players in the quintet, each getting to take a solo. And so they, again, present new and different melodies. There's a very quick tempo here and a strong dialogue between the players. The second movement of the piece has this sort of relaxed Sicilian rhythm to it. And the last movement, as you might predict, goes fast. It's a presto movement. There's two main themes that are presented, a very fast, light theme, and then a lyrical and expansive one that leads up into a very fast and bright coda to end the piece. It's somewhat unusual to have a concerto for a group rather than one solo instrument, isn't it? Yes, as concertos developed over time, we're all familiar with piano concertos and violin concertos where you have one soloist playing with an orchestra. And that dialogue can be back and forth or the orchestra can be in a much more subservient role, kind of backing up the soloist. It's not crazy to have more than one soloist. We've all heard of double concertos. There are things like triple concertos for piano, cello, and violin or something like that. Um, so to have several soloists in your concerto is not unheard of, but a brass quintet, mm -hmm. that is a little bit abnormal. And the instrumentation of a brass quintet is two trumpets, a French horn, a trombone, and a tuba. That's a lot of voices and a lot of ability to generate sound um, <laughs> to sort of shoehorn into a concerto format. It is not something that happens very often, but it is not completely unheard of either. Mm -hmm. A brass quintet concerto certainly has some shared DNA with brass chamber music. How long have people been writing chamber music for a group like that? So it's a relatively new thing to occur, and by relatively new in the context of Western music, <laughs> I mean the mid to late 1800s, uh, which sounds like a long time ago, but if you think back to classical music and Baroque music and things mm -hmm. like that, we're really in sort of a new era when you start writing this type of music for brass. This development of brass chamber music or brass music being featured in orchestral concerts really coincided with the invention and development of brass instruments which could play chromatically. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean brass instruments used to not be able to play all the notes. If you <laughs> imagine blowing into a tube uh, or one of those horns that people blow at a football game, <laughs> you can get one or two, maybe three pitches out of that. And, and that's based on the harmonic series. A, a long cone, a brass tube has a certain frequency and you can get these pitches that are arranged in a certain way. People used to just have that for brass instruments. They could only play two or three notes. And so you had to write the piece in the key that those horns would sound in, which meant they didn't get used very much. 
the players would keep a little bag of pipes next to their chair and extend the length of the instrument to try to get it to play in different keys. <laughs> Again, this is a time consuming and somewhat sort of wonky process. <laughs> well, eventually valves were invented and now you could change the length of that instrument by pressing a button like on a trumpet or a French horn. A trombone uses a slide to change the length of the tube. And so with those developments in place, they really started to create better instruments. And that means by the time we get to World War II, there really hadn't been that many symphonic pieces or chamber music pieces, especially for brass, but then that's sort of the taking off point and everybody started writing for brass. So the development of sort of serious, significant writing for brass coincided with this development in the construction of the instruments. That's right, and likewise, those two things made it possible for people to start practicing and playing brass instruments more, so we have the development of the players. All these things kind of happened just within the last 100, 150 years. And it is true, there are Mozart pieces that call for trombones. Trumpet is an old instrument, mm -hmm. but these things just weren't really used in large symphonic works. Mozart did a little bit of that in some of his choral music. Beethoven was probably the first composer to start using trombones. He, he wrote trombone parts in three of his nine symphonies. Uh, but even those were for more archaic instruments. As we get into the World War II era, the sky was the limit and people could start writing whatever they wanted to write. When we listen to the Broton's Concerto for Brass Quintet and Orchestra, there are not other brass players on the stage. I think Salvador was smart to say five brass players as the feature is enough. Mm -hmm. And you can actually create more dialogue and have more um, concise, and his music is concise, mm -hmm. uh, interplay between the soloists and the orchestra if it's a string orchestra without things just getting too crazily loud. You can definitely hear in this music the way these instruments and the players have developed. This is virtuoso stuff, and the parts that he wrote for each player in the quintet really showcase their ability and showcase the ability of these modern brass instruments to play some pretty complicated writing, which again did not exist 200 years ago. Well, it's clear we've got a really exciting start to this season. I cannot wait to hear these three wonderful pieces. Me neither.